glory, risen, conquering sun. Endless is the victory, thou, O death, hast won. And no more we doubt of thee, glorious Prince of life. Life is not without thee, aid us in our strife. O oh, death, where is the sting? O oh, grave, where is the victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, uh, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abiding in the works of the Lord. For as much as ye, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. May the Lord bless this way into our hearts in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you for what you have been doing in our lives. Thank you for what you want to do even now. We ask that, Lord, as you send us your word through your servant, let your word, Lord, be that that we pierce through our hearts, that that we open our understanding and help us to see through your words this morning in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for we know this arena, your presence is here. Thank you for being here with us. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to look at today what you must know about death. You must know about it. John chapter 14. I hear laughter. Who's laughing over there? How dare you guys? Um, you can hear and laughter seems to, you know, carry waffles. I know. I was up all night listening to it next door. Oh, Amen. When I was on vacation uh, a little while ago, we went to a, a distant town from here over into the States, and uh, my son and I walked into a, a curiosity shop, I guess is what you would call it, and as we were looking around, I, I, I couldn't help but notice that there were many uh, gothic pictures and statues all throughout this, this store, and uh, there were skulls, I mean there were skulls and there were grim reapers everywhere, you know? And they had colorful skulls, they had silver skulls, they had grim reapers, you know, with all, all that going on. And I said to the salesperson, I just couldn't help it, but I, I said, it looks to me like you enjoy celebrating death. Because I want to see how he would respond. And sure enough, he was, a, uh, he was a little bit on the defensive and sheepishly. He tried to put this positive spin on his wares that they were selling by saying that it's not about the death, it's about renewal. And I'm looking around, and I don't see a whole lot of renewal when I see somebody's skull sitting there. I don't think, you know, he's renewed, and the Grim Reaper's waiting for you. I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't quite see what he was trying to get at. And I think even as he was talking to us, I don't even think he believed it. But it's just something he had to say something, right? You know, no, we're not celebrating death. And um, so we, we had a, a good talk about that. There was, but there was, no, there was no brightness. There was no celebration of life. There was no hope of the prospects of life after death. And as a result, I was able to give him one of those gospel cards. And I said, hey, you might want to look at this online and check this out. This is celebrates something a little bit different than that. So I left that with him. And uh, some people, you know, they, they come to grips with death different ways. Some people come to, to grips by, uh, by avoiding the topic. That's what I mean. I, sometimes you say, hey, I'm going to preach today on death. People won't, just won't show up because they don't want to talk about it. They, it's, it's something they, they don't want to uh, put into their mind. Some deal with death by laughing it off. I mean, everything's a big joke. They have to do that because that way they can avoid the, the seriousness of it and the ultimate uh, um, fact that it's going to happen to them. And some people, they'll even celebrate death. I mean, somehow by making, making a big celebration and getting so close to it, somehow that'll help you overcome any fear. So the people try different things, and these attempts uh, uh, to diminish the ultimate, uh, what ultimately cannot be avoided, um, well, they seem to fall short, to be honest with you. I see a lot of people with a lot of, a lot of hopelessness going on in the world today. 
And um, I, I've been, uh, you know, I think I've been a born-again Christian for so long that I have forgotten the terror that death brings to people uh, who are not prepared for it. People who, who are not a born-again Christian, who remember Jesus said, you must be born again. We looked at that a few weeks ago. It was a must. And uh, in fact, I think even Christians, if you lose sight of the Word of God, if you lose sight of the Word of God, I find that it, 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 you get easily swept up into the fear of death. And what that does is it robs you of the joy and the power to live today. Because there's, in the back of your mind, there's this terror, this trembling that goes on with death. So regardless of your situation in today's sermon, I would like to provide you some important information on what you must know about death. Because there's some things you must know. Just like you must be born again, there's some things you need to know about death. And the first thing I want us to see is the biblical truth on death. The biblical truth on death is that death is not your end. You understand that? Death is not your end. Uh, the uh, prevailing thought accepted by educators and policymakers today is that of naturalism. Okay, everything has to it, like it has to be seen, or else it doesn't exist. It's, it, it has this naturalism that goes by, and it, it's a, a view of that only the only reality is what you can actually touch and see and observe. So that's uh, what they have, and the secular view uh, of life has left the supernatural out. And I believe that's possibly the reason that we are so obsessed with superheroes today. If you look at all the movies and everything else, superheroes, because there's, there's a, in the soul there's this emptiness. If you just say, well, this is all there is, there's an emptiness. And I think that's why there's a big thing for the, the occult today. They're trying to fill in the void, not God's way, unfortunately, but they have to fill, fill the void somehow. So they're trying to fill it in those ways. Um, so, in this, uh, this uh, worldview, death is the end of existence. Man is just a collection of chemical processes. And, uh, and basically what they look at is when the body's chemistry ceases to function, the person ceases to exist. That's that view of it. And uh, a person must then live their life solely based on today. So everything is for today. All the rewards are today, so you go for everything. You try to get as much money, as much pleasure, as much anything you can today, because in the grave there's nothing. And there's, that's, that's what we've been peddling to people in our children, in our schools, in our, in our um, institutions, everywhere. There's just this lack of celebration of that the, there is a God, there's something beyond this. And so I see a country that is really hungering, hungering for something that's more, because this is what separates us from animals. Because animals don't care, you see. It wasn't put in them, okay? They have emotions and things like we do to a certain degree. But the one thing that wasn't put into them, it was the, the concern about the afterlife. They never look up to God. They look up to man sometimes for help. My cats do every morning when it's food time. They look up to me and they'll stare me down because there's a connection there. But they don't care beyond me. That's where it ends. Beyond our house where they live, that's where it ends. The thing is, is man wasn't created that way. Man was created a living soul. He was created with something inside of his soul that would make him reach beyond what is here that we can see and observe, whether it's out in space, wherever it is, wherever we can observe, it's go beyond. And again, that's why I believe a lot of people get into the occult. They want, they need, there's something missing there. And I think Satan knows that too. And so he's trying to offer replacements for this. And unfortunately, we seem to, to buy that quite quite easily. So, according to the scriptures, such a view is wrong. Men will live after death. And Jesus has foretold that. So if you got your Bibles there, Gen I'm sorry, not Genesis, we'll go to John. John chapter 14, verse 19. John chapter 14, verse 19. I want to show you something that I, I, I think is just a, a treasure promise from the, the Savior to, to those who follow him. So in John 14, 19, he says, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. And here's what it is. Here's what I hang on to. Because I live, ye shall live also. I like that, man. That's confidence there. And uh, in this context, Jesus is speaking of the future life, the life that will follow the initial existence on this earth. And if you go back... Uh, uh, a bit there in John 14, verse 1. John 14, 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Again, we preach this a lot at, at funerals. Let, to Christians, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. These are great and precious promises from the Savior himself. And these verses would be nothing more than wishful thinking if it wasn't for one thing, the verifiable resurrection of Jesus Christ. If he said that and never came back, or a couple people said that they saw him or something like that, I would not be preaching today. I wouldn't waste my time. But there's something that really, really gets me about this promise about life after death, and that is the verifiable resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I have a secular job that I work Monday through Friday at, and uh, sometimes I have to deal with, with phone calls. Sometimes I have to deal with emails that come in. And what I have to do, if somebody has uh, an issue with a product that they have bought from the company I, I represent, I, have to, I can't just start talking about that product. I can't start talking about their account until I verify who they are. i got to verify who they are. We have a thing called the Privacy Act, so I have to do Now, in our company, and uh, there's at least five specific questions. Well, there are five specific questions that I have to ask these people when they con first uh, contact us. I need to verify who they are. I need to know that they are real and that they're true who they say they are before I can start talking to them. So the, these things that I, that I go. And um, I, I'm just wondering, that this verification requires those five questions that I've asked, but the legal world of today just seeks just five proofs. That's it, five proofs in my case here. And then I can blab all about your, your accounts, your finances, the products you own, everything else. I just need you to, over the phone or through an email, just answer these questions correctly, these five proofs. And uh, the, so the legal world just looks for that. And now, if, if we were to put the same claim to Jesus and what he said about the resurrection, how would he stack up? Could we verify Jesus in his resurrection? But could we at least find five proofs that Jesus Christ came back from the dead like he promised he would? Because if we can, then there is life after death. Amen. There is. Amen. And then not only that, but those who put their trust in him will come back after that. But, but first, okay, so now I'll put my headset on and I'll get the phone call in and I'll, I'll verify Jesus to make sure that he really did come back from the dead. Got your Bibles? Here's where we're going to verify them. There's other ones you could do too, but 1 Corinthians 15, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I believe we were looking at uh, in that area there a little bit later on. I uh, had David read that, but 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. I need to find if we can verify the resurrection. If Jesus is who he claims to be, if there truly is life after death, I need something here. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 says, For I delivered... Unto you first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose from the dead, uh, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now here it is, here it is, here's the verification. Well, how do we know this? He said he would, and you're saying he did, but I got to verify him, okay? Let's look at it. Verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas. Okay, so you got Peter and the disciples there, Cephas. Then of the twelve, okay, all together. After that, uh, he was seen of a, above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this day, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And, la and last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. So let us consecutively count how many people that these people in Corinth could use as witness, witnesses to, to verify that the resurrection happened. So let's look there in verses 5 through 8. So we see here, let's add them up. Let's add them up. Let's do some math, okay? Here's the thing I like about the Bible. is It's concrete, it's solid, and you put your faith in it, okay? It's not some guy just had a dream one night and you got to follow it. Here's what, here's what he said to the people in his time, and they could verify this. He said there were 12, okay? He said Cephas and 12. I'm going to take a conservative look at it, so I'm going to blend them together. There was 12, plus 500 other brethren, okay? Well, there, you say there, there was more than that. Yeah, but some of them were deceased, so let's take a conservative. So there was 12 plus 500. What's that? 512, okay? Then James, okay? And uh, finally, Paul, 
512, 13, 14. 514 witnesses. That's a little bit more than five that we require here to divulge all your personal information to the person. But now let's go back over this again, and this time count up, uh, this time don't count the people, but rather the instances. Okay, so number one, he was seen of Cephas. Number two, he was seen of the 12, that's two. Then he was seen of 500 plus, that's three. Then he was seen of James, that's four. Then of the apostles, that's five. Then of the apostle Paul, six. On six different occasions by at least 514 people that were still alive at that time, Jesus Christ was witnessed to have existed, okay? That's a little bit more verification than the five simple questions that I ask people here on earth. And yet, and under our Privacy Act and within our, our, our culture that's ever so legalistic and everything else, make sure that you, you dot the I and cross the T, all they required was five things. Man, I, I've proven over here of 514, over 514 things, and it, not just five occasions, six occasions. So what do you think we should do? People will say, I mean, it comes down to, to whether you want to believe it or not. I'm just telling you logically, I'm telling you intellectually, there's not much more Jesus could do to prove that he came back from the dead. And this book here was written to a church in Corinth. In other words, that church people, and it was given to them for a reason, okay? It was given to them for a reason because when Paul wrote to that church, he says, I want you to know you can go over to these people and talk to them. Talk to all of them. A lot of them are still alive. They're all still kicking. Go and talk to them. Boy, that's a gutsy move. You go into a lot of churches, a lot of faiths, a lot of religions, and it's like, don't look behind the curtain. Okay, we got some mystical thing. You just trust what we have to say. You know, the Christian religion is wide open. Go ahead and verify it. Remember uh, Doubting Thomas? Are you, I, I can't believe this. Are you really, come on. What did Jesus say? He said, come on. He says, you touch, you touch the wounds that I have. You, come on. My goodness, that's the Christian faith that we need to have. Not this doubtful, wimpy little thing. But I bring this to your attention for this. Not, not to get you all swelled up with pride or anything like that, but I want you to understand something. That that same Jesus Christ that came back from the dead and was verified, fully verified, at that time, and the Word of God, which has been, I mean, this has gone through the fires of time, so that you can still read it for yourself today. And the Spirit of God that speaks to your heart today as it's preached and taught, all of that was done for a reason that you could verify that there is life after death because Jesus said, I'm coming back, he came back, he proved it, and then he makes this other thing that we hang on to. He says, because I live, you shall live also. He's talking to his followers. That's amazing, man. You guys should be excited. You should be shouting and, and hooting and hollering and stuff like that. David, stop containing yourself like that. Let it go. Man. Let it go. Okay. David says down in, uh, where is it? Uh, where are you from? Nigeria. You dance around. This is a dancing moment. Okay. You can bounce around. It's all right. There's moments to do that. This is one. I'm excited about it. Okay. Because I'm not getting this kind of, uh, you know, from, from anywhere else in this this country that I live in, any other excitement, but I find it in the Word of God. So the biblical truth is, uh, on death, is that death is not your end, okay? It's proven, it's verified. So John 14, 9, again, he says, he says, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. And, but there's one word of caution. This passage of living after death with Jesus is for born-again Christians only, okay? That's why Jesus was so adamant when he talked to that religious ruler, when he was talking to Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. You must be. You must be, because he wanted to see him. The, God's not willing that any should perish. He wants them all in life after death to be with him in life after death. Tragically, for the unsaved, the death, uh, death is not their end either. But it's not a joyous resurrection that they will... Uh, encounter, and we'll look at that a little, bit, a little bit later. So, but the first thing I want you to see: death is not your end. Second thing I'm going to throw this in as a bonus, and that is, is that death does not put your soul to sleep. Okay, death does not put your soul to sleep. Now, there's a lot of cults out there that that mimic true Christianity, and they tell you that when you die, your soul goes to sleep, and, and until the resu full resurrection, then you kind of wake up, and it's like nothing had happened. No, not according to Scripture, because I want you to know the truth about death, what you must know about death. Death does not put your soul to sleep. Now, again, 
Some people view that uh, when a person dies, their soul goes to sleep, and it's kind of hanging out with the decaying body there, you see, waiting, waiting for that type of a resurrection. And, and it's in this view, uh, the, the soul and the body are indivisible. Uh, however, Scripture does not support this at all. You got your Bibles? Luke chapter 23, please. Luke chapter 23. Jesus shows us this. Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Luke chapter 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my, what's the next word? Spirit. spirit. Not his body, but he said, I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. At his own death upon the cross, Jesus yielded up the ghost or his, his human spirit, if you will. It's separated from his body. That's what death means. It means separation. So if the soul is hanging out with the body and they're both sleeping somewhere or something like that, it, there's a complete separation. But notice where he says that. He, he, where does he, he deliver it up to? He, he says so long. He says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Into your hands. And then at his, uh, at, uh, his death upon the cross, we, we find that. And similarly, we also find that with Stephen, who was stoned to death. And look over to Acts chapter 7, verse 59. So we see Jesus, there's a separation, so they're not the same thing. Your spirit, your body are two separate entities. One's immaterial, one is material. The immaterial is not going to sleep, but the material has to. It has to because of the judgment. Similarly, when, when Stephen was stoned, as we see here. We find him praying to Jesus, who had already died before him. In Acts chapter 7, verse 59, it says, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now, where is Jesus at this moment? He's in heaven, okay? So where is his spirit going to be? In heaven. Okay, so there's a division there. And it's, the, the next verse explains really a Bible passage referring to sleep there and, and distinguishes the soul from the body. And he looked there in verse 60. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. Kind of interesting because that's what Jesus did. He cried with a loud voice just before his death. Crowd with, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had uh, said this, he fell asleep. Well, wait a minute. He said before he was going to separate, he says, take my, take my soul, my spirit, take that. And then his body, what, what fell asleep? His body did. It had to go back to the ground and decompose from the matter from which it was originally created. That is the judgment. That's the first death, okay? It's something we have to do. It's not a nice thing, but it's a result of the fact that all men are sinners. And uh, that has to happen. So, again, the believer will be in the presence of Jesus Christ, soul will be. But to the unbeliever, they also wake up too, don't they? We've seen that with the rich man and Lazarus. He woke up, he lifted up his eyes, and he was in, he was in torments, in the fire, the flames of hell. There was no sleep there. And same with, with uh, uh, the, uh, Lazarus. He was awake. They were awake. They were talking. They were communicating with each other in the, the land of the dead, but there was a big gulf fixed between them that they could not cross over. There was the damned, and then there was those who were being comforted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And so we see that, but they were very much awake. They very much experienced it. But there was sleep, but it's of the body. So I want you to understand that the biblical truth on death is, first of all, death is not your end. Death does not put your soul to sleep. So when you die, you wake up somewhere. The question is, where do you wake up? Where do you wake up? You're going to learn in this sermon, you're going to learn, because I'm going to start talking about the next thing. Uh, the first thing we looked at, the biblical truth on death. The next thing we're going to look at, the biblical truth on final judgment. You're going to find this out. You cannot choose your death. Do you know that? But you can choose your judgment. I, I, there's people, and I, I've read about it, and you'll see, you can even see them on YouTube videos where they were in a, some of them tried to kill themselves, but they didn't work. They thought that they could plan their death. You don't die until God says you die. 
There have been people who fell out of airplanes and their chutes didn't open. They lived to tell the story. That's, that freaks me out. But you don't get to choose your death, but you do get to choose your judgment after that death. And so let's look here. He said, there are, and there are two future final judgments God has reserved for those who have passed on from this earth. And for the purpose of my sermon today, <clears throat> I wish to present them in reverse order. Okay? I want to show them to you in reverse order because before we look at them, let me clearly state that no judgment in the future will determine whether an individual goes to heaven or not. Amen. Okay? You got your Bibles? John 3.18. I want you to see something very serious here. Because some people, John 3.18, some people actually believe, well, you know, in the, the judgment after I die, then I'll have a chance to make my, my appeal to God. Ooh, not according to God's word. Now, if your word is stronger than his, you got a shot, but I don't think your word is stronger than his. So in God's word, John 3, 18, it says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. That's good. He's not judged. But what happens to him that believeth not? He is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You're condemned already. The judgment is here right now. These judgment, in other words, where are you going to spend eternity? That's here. That's now. It's not later on at, at these judgments we're going to look at. You'll have a chance to make an appeal. No, there won't be any appeals, okay? You can, you can spend years and millions and millions of dollars in appeals here on this earth, but after your death, there's no appeal because you've already been judged. If you don't have Christ in your, as your Savior, you've already been judged in this life. That's why it's so important. What we do is so important here. So the first thing I want to do is look at the, the, one of the two final judgments of all mankind, and I'm going to look at the very, very last one, and that is the great white throne judgment. Okay, the great white throne judgment. For that, go over to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. We're going to go into the future, and as I've said many times, the Bible I love about it because I can go back in the past in history. I can go ahead in the future. I can look at the here and now. It's all there, baby. It's all there. Okay? God opens it all up. So nobody's going to stand one day and say, I didn't know. Oh, it's all there. If you want to know, it's there. But we're going to look at the great white throne judgment here. And we're going to see what it says. This last, very last judgment God places upon men is called great white throne judgment, as we'll see right here in verse 11. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. Okay, so we're not making this up. This is biblical. A great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. So we live in time and space. Remember in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth? Boom, gone here. When he comes for this last final judgment upon mankind, gone. Where is it going to be? I don't know. It's not in heaven. It's not on earth. But there's a spot. He's got reserved, and he's got a great white throne there. And you are going to see what happens here. This final judgment, it will occur at the end of the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. Let me tell you something, folks. That's the one person that I'm going to vote for is Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't care who you vote for. I'm looking for that thousand-year reign when he comes. Because, and at the end of that, this is when this, this great white throne judgment happens. If you look here, it says, those being judged must stand before the throne. And it's, the throne is described. It's great. First of all, it's great. It's talking about its dimensions, especially its height. It's great, okay? So when you stand before that, I hope you don't, actually. Uh, please don't. But those who stand before this particular judgment at the very end, they're going to be looking upward, okay? Not even upward, because it is great, okay? It says great white is referring to its brilliance. It's dazzling white. It's a shining it's going to be like a shining thing. So you're going to be standing there, and this thing is going to be so bright, so, so, so holy, that it's going to be shining in the eyes. And it says it's a throne, which refers to a kingly seat of power and authority. So whoever it is, this is like a courtroom. This person has authority. He's been given authority, and he's got the power to judge righteously. We're looking at the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's going to be looking at people. So we look at this, and notice the people must stand before uh, him, the, the Lord at this judgment. Verse 12, and I saw the dead, small, and great. You know, there's some people here on this earth, we think they're pretty great. 
Man, they're popular. They're great. They're smart. They're whatever they are. They got, they got it going. Some have a lot of money. Some have billions of dollars. And I've been told that possibly even in my lifetime, I might see the world's first trillionaire. I mean, that's a lot of power, folks, okay? When some of us are just trying to make our bills payments each, each pay. And, but some of these people are great. They're powerful. Some people we have on the earth, whatever they say, everybody hangs on every word they say. When they stand up there, they got the people taking pictures and video, and they're listening to everything they say because it has so much power. These people are great, okay? And they are, to us, they're great, but they're not greater than the person at this judgment. That's what I said, the great white throne judgment. It's going to be high that even the small and the great will be looking up like this. It'll be a different thing for them. Might be good for us to be prepared that we don't have to face this one. Because it says here, and stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written, not in the books, but in, or in the book, but in the books. So there's some books here, and it's about each individual, and he's going to open up, this is your life, and he's going to look and he's going to judge you, what you did with your life. And it, but if you're name is not in the book of life, then it's going to be damnable. Everything's going to be held against you. Okay, according to their works. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead. There's nobody that escapes this one. Which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Okay? Now pay very close attention to the fact that physical death is not the end for unbelievers. Talk about unbelievers here. It's not the end. Everybody keeps saying, oh, person's at peace now. Not if they don't know Jesus Christ. Oh, this person struggled in their life, but they're at peace now. We lie to ourselves, okay? Now, I can lie to you right now and say, yeah, that's the case. But I can't if I'm going to preach the truth. Because you can read it and call me a liar. And that's, I don't want you to be able to do that. But it's saying here that if you don't know Jesus Christ, whatever you suffered on this earth, this is just the beginning. Well, why would you say that? Because I have to preach the truth that people can't be prepared. Okay? So pay close attention to this. Also, hell is not their final place of torment, but it's a rather a waiting uh, chamber for them for what happens after that. These individuals must make their appearance before the great white throne judgment. They get spit out of hell. Some of them have been there for thousands of years. If that wasn't bad enough, they, now they stand before this great judge, and he's going to open up all the books of the life that they had when they were living on this earth, and he's going to judge them accordingly. It's not going to be a good thing, by the way. And they're going to have to make an account. So if you look there in verse 14, Revelation 20, 14, and, and death and hell, what, they just were obliterated? No, they were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. You see, to a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, they're not born-again Christians. Death here on earth is just the first death. There's a second death. We need to preach this. Man. We need to get this out to the world. There's a second death coming, and they better be prepared for it. Verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into, this lake, uh, into the lake of fire. Okay, so this is, uh, it, it, folks, there, there's no reason that any human being, this was prepared, everything was prepared for the devil and his angels. This was the, the ultimate uh, punishment for them. For what they did to God in God's glorious heaven, how they turned their back on the Holy One of God who created them and said, No, we will be worshipped, not you. We will rise up, not you. We will be equal to you. He said, Oh, yeah. And here they, they get the lake of fire. Unfortunately, anyone who follows after them gets the same fate. Not good. But you don't have to. Okay? As I said, you can't choose your death but you can choose your judgment. So this, this, is, this is a horrible judgment. Now, if we go to the next slide, I want you to see something here. I'm just putting out some facts there. So the great white throne judgment, some facts, okay? Uh, who? Well, everyone who died without knowing Jesus is their Lord and Savior because now they don't have an advocate to go for them. They have to answer to them, to God themselves personally with all their sin. What? what? Well, each person's life will be measured against God's perfect uh, standard of holiness. Do you think that big bright light, you think you're going to be brighter than him? I think there's a lot of darkness in us. That's going to be measured against that, him and what? When? Well, after Jesus' millennial reign, 
Hey, when it's all said and done, just before he brings in the new heaven and earth, when the old ones fl uh, flee away from him, there's a moment here of great judgment. Where? And we're not sure because it uh, won't be in heaven, won't be on earth, but why? To settle the rebellion against God's righteousness. There's coming a time there will be nobody else standing up shaking their fist to God. They're doing it now. Amen. Small and great. Small and great people. And it's not just the rich people. There's poor people. And everything. Every, there's a lot of people shaking their fists. There will be no shaking of the fists when this comes because God's going to settle that rebellion once and for all. He says, this is it. This is it. So we have that. And if you go uh, 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 over there, the first thing I want you to see is that. But the other thing I want you to see is um, in all of this situation that there's another judgment seat. There's another one. And this is why I saved it second, even though it happens before the great white throne judgment. But I want to leave you with some hope, folks. Because what good is it me preaching on you people and beating you all up with your sin and the judgment that's coming and everything else if there's no hope? I wouldn't want to be here. But there's great hope. There's great hopeful. And, and uh, I want you to see that. And that is at another judgment seat, the, the judgment seat of Christ. You got your Bible, 2 Corinthians 5. I want you to see this. The judgment seat of Christ. This is the judgment. I said there were two. The great white throne, which is the last one. This is the one that precedes this. This is another one I want you to see. And it is the judgment seat of Christ. And this one is for Christians. So let's look at the judgment that precedes the great white throne. And by the way, again, you get to choose which judgment you face. Isn't that a gift God's giving you? Can't choose your death, but you can choose your judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. So he's talking right off the bat to these Christians that live in Corinth and go to that church. He says, I want you to know, we, we walk by faith, not by sight. And we are confident. I like that. Confidence. That's what I'm saying. The word of God is concrete. There's a lot of verification, a lot of proof right there. Test them. Put God to the test. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be acceptable of him. For we must, oh, he's talking to Christians now, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, this judgment of, of God is much different than the great white throne judgment of God. Okay, for one thing, the people being judged here are those of faith. It says that right there in verse 7. Also, he uses the pronoun we. So the Apostle Paul uh, keeps including himself with this group of people. So this is not the great white throne judgment. It's for a different type of people. And then also notice there in verse 10, it's the term judgment seat. It comes from the word bima. It's a Greek word, bima. And that's why sometimes instead of judgment seat, they call it the bima seat of Christ. It's the same thing. One is English, one is, is the Greek. The bima seat or the judgment seat of Christ, this is for Christians. And this comes before, before uh, uh, the millennial reign of Christ. This comes before, uh, way before the, uh, the great white throne judgment. And the, the, the setup of this judgment is different from the great white throne judgment. And notice that it's called a seat and not a throne. This judgment is a, is a seat and not a throne. In other words, this seat refers to a position, uh, someone who's elevated in position, not a, as a judge, but more like you see in that picture there, someone who is going to be judging a person and, and handing out rewards of crowning. But they are still elevated higher up, okay? It's a judgment seat. It's not a courtroom situation. It's a, different, it's a different scenario that's going on here. And this is the time when all Christian believers must stand individually before Christ. Do you know that, Christian? Why, well, I got out of the great white throne judgment. Yeah, but you got a different one. You got the beam of seat of Christ. You got the judgment seat of Christ you got to face alone with. And uh, for this reason, I believe that it's going to be more intimidating than we think. You hear that, folks? As a Christian, you might say, well, I'm born again Christian. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I've, I've accepted the fact that I'm a sinner, and I've called out to, to God's Son, Jesus Christ, to be my Savior, and I've received him by faith. I've invited him into my heart. I'm saved, everything else. So now I'm, I can live the way I want to live. Well, yeah, you can, 
but you got to face this time, okay? You got to face this moment where you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be intimidating. Imagine standing one on one with the Savior and giving an account of everything you did in your body after you received forgiveness. Everything. And he's going to hold, he takes it serious. My son went to the cross. He died for you. You received him. You became a born again Christian. How did you repay and thank him? How did you do it with your body? Well, I lived a life for myself. Oh, you've got to give an answer to him. Are you going to be judged and cast in the lake of fire? No. Praise God. Are you going to get any rewards? No. What a shame. And you are actually going to have to, to face him. So the, it is a seat of reward, but the believer can su uh, suffer real loss at this judgment. Since the purpose, as you look there in verse 10, since the purpose that everyone may, give, uh, may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Some people say, well, he's just looking at the good so you can reward. He's looking at the bad too. He's looking you over, okay? He's doing a forensics of on you. So our faith and service to Christ will be evaluated and rewarded and with perfect knowledge. You can't, you can't smoke screen this. And the prospect of this coming judgment should motivate us to be more like Christ in our daily lives. It really should. Self-discipline requires not only for us to say no to bad things, but also say no to good things that we may, uh, may have been good in themselves, but we should have pushed to the side so we could do the best things for the Lord. Let me ask you this. When you face Jesus Christ, do you want to say, hey, listen, I gave you my good? Or do you want to say to him, I gave you my best? It's been said that the enemy, uh, that, uh, that good is the enemy of the best. Some people just settle for good. Oh, it's not bad. It's good. But is it the best? Is it the best? What are you doing with your life? Oh, I'm going to sleep and, and just kind of lazily go through my life. Or are you going to give them your best? That means you have to say no to bad stuff, and you have to say no to the good stuff that's going to prevent you from getting to the best stuff for the Lord Jesus Christ. Is he not worth it? That means there's a struggle. That means there, there's a, they, there, you're going to have to discipline yourself, and that's why we call them disciples. The 12 disciples, these guys were being disciplined by Jesus Christ, and they went through a lot of torments, even to the point of death, but they got honed right in so that they, everything else, is, is, like is, is, is the Bible says, was done for the cause of Jesus Christ. Even the good stuff in this earth. If it's not for Christ, if it's not the best for Christ, then I don't want it. I need the best for him. Because everything in my life, and I don't know about you, but everything in my life, and, and I feel I'm not perfect, you know that. But I just know this, is that I want to keep honing my skills that I live for Christ so that that one day, you just say just for that one day, that one moment at the, the judgment seat of Christ, I can give him my best that I had. Amen. That's what we should be aiming for as Christians. We're so sloppy. Amen. You just look at some half the churches. You know what, and I, you have preached this before, and I don't have to go on and on about it, but you see these preachers come in with ripped jeans? You pig. You say, how could you say that, preacher? Did they give Jesus Christ, the Lord, their best? Amen. They gave him garbage. Garbage. They dress down. They try to act, oh, I just want to be like the rest of you. You're speaking for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now you stand up there and be a man, not a woman, a man, and preach the word of God in truth to people. And stop Fooling around. My goodness, there's no fear in these churches anymore. No. I don't have it here, but I've seen so many of them where they pull out their cell phones and the, the music's going and they got their, they're in the mosh pit and they're just waving it around like a bunch of idiots, a bunch of fools. Where's the fear? Amen. Why aren't you falling down? Because one day you will and so will I. I'm going to be down there. I'm going to be like, I'm not going to be proud. I'm not going to be waving any lights around when I come to the beam and see the Christ Christian. I'm going to be down there, and I have to give another answer, not just for being a Christian, but for being a pastor. And let me tell you something. I've dropped the ball so many times that I have to get back up again and say, Lord, forgive me. i got to get better. i got to hone my abilities for you better. And so must you. Amen. Okay? I hope you didn't just come here for, for fellowship or for some ear tickling or something like that. Because there's a day coming, and as I said before, and there's, there's, two, there's a double meaning to it. When I said, you don't get to choose your death, but you get to choose your judgment. Christian, 
Not only do you get your choose your judgment away from the great white throne judgment, but you get to choose what kind of judgment you get. You, the, he's got crowns. There's at least five crowns that are mentioned in the Bible that are given to Christians. What do you want? He's going to reign for a thousand years, and he's looking for administrators. Where are you going to be in that administration? Down at the low, are you going to be sweeping floors, sweeping the streets for a thousand years? Or are you going to be reigning higher for Christ because you gave him your all in this life? And then after that, and then after that comes this judgment. And you get to, or, or not after that, but after, after this judgment, after that thousand years, there's a new heaven, a new earth that goes on into eternity, not just a thousand years. Where are you going to be stationed? As your preacher, as your pastor, I'm trying to encourage you to give God your best now. With what's in your body, what you can give him now, give him your best. All right? Don't give him the slop or the good. Give him all you can. Because I have to give an account for you. You don't even think about that, do you? I have to give an account for you. When you don't show up on a Sunday... I'm not sick. I'm not going. I just, just don't feel like it. I got to give an account for you. I got to be praying for you. I got to be talking to you. I got to be constantly going after. And so does Pastor Joe, and so do other fellow Christians who want to be a part of it. They pick up the phone. We try to encourage each other because I know life is horrible down here at times. Sometimes it's not so bad. But other times it's devastating. We need to pick each other up, and, do, and we need to do it in the name of Jesus Christ. He's a man, if you just give somebody a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus, but do it in the name of Jesus Christ, he's, he's putting that to your account. He's watching you. So there's so much we have to look at in this. And, and folks, forgive me for, for yelling and screaming and jumping around, but I don't know what else to do when I look at this stuff. But as I said, when you give that account to Jesus Christ, you can't call it in. You can't say, well, you know what, I'll phone it in, or I'll video conference the Lord. No, when it's your turn, it's your turn. You are front and center. The word appear means just that, physically there. You, him, alone. I want you to have the best experience. I want you to be so excited that you, not perfect, but you did the best you could with your lives as Christians. I want you to, be, I want you to have that experience when this day comes, because it will come. The world, hey, the world doesn't even exist, uh, believe that death, a life after death exists. They definitely don't want to talk about this. But the word of God, and I've verified it for you, and I could go over and over and over again, is that the fact that Jesus Christ was real, Jesus Christ did die, Jesus Christ did come back from the dead, he was witnessed by, by people, was ch and people were challenged to back up that witness, and then that same one said, because I live, Christian, you will live also. And he also said that there's a judgment seat coming, and that means it's going to be there. You cannot avoid it. You're going to be there. You don't get to choose your death, but you do get to choose your judgment. And Christian, you get to choose what kind of judgment you're going to have. I want you to have the best. But that means that we have to shape up, My starting with myself. And I try. Father, we thank you again for this time to be in your house, Lord. The facts of death, Lord, as we, we learn from you that death is not the end. Help us not to fall asleep listening to the educators and the psychologists and anyone in this world who would try to talk us out of the fact that there is miraculous areas of life, such as eternity. Father, we must need to be prepared for that eternity, our death. And if there's someone here that's doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. If there's someone, please talk to them, Lord, to their heart. Go beyond wherever I could reach, Lord, and convict them of their sin, that they would do everything they possibly could today to settle that matter, that they need Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because once they die, then comes the second judgment, and with it the second death after the great white throne judgment. So speak to them. And for the rest of us who are born-again Christians already, we've trusted in you. We, we want to live for you, Lord. But sometimes we get caught up in the world too. And you're, but you're going to judge us too. And you want to give us rewards. You want to heap more than just uh, eternal life. You want to give us crowns. We're not worthy of that. But Lord, help us not also to be seeking just mediocrities, just so that we can just sit there with no rewards, no administrations for you and your kingdom. Help us to give you our all, our best.
Be with Forest City Baptist Church. We really need you, Lord. It's not just a bunch of people showing up on Sunday. We really need you. We need, we need you in our lives. We need you to help us with our families. We need you to help us with our health in all areas of life down here. But most important of all, Lord, we need you to stir us that we would do eternal works for you so that we can be eternally rewarded. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.